And welcome everyone to the presentation tonight. We're really glad you're here. Um, we have a treat for you tonight. We've got Dr. Rebecca Browder from Westport, Connecticut, um, and she's going to be sharing some amazing information with us about how she utilizes digital tools as well as AI in her practice to level up her patient care in her comprehensive exams. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much. So happy to be here virtually with all of you from all across the country. Again, I'm Dr. Gordon Barfield. I'm a clinical manager over here at Overjet. I'm a licensed dentist as well as an orthodontist, and I'm your host tonight. So we're really glad you're here. We're going to have a fun uh, back and forth, get some wonderful information from Dr. Browder. And before we do that, though, we do need to button up a couple of housekeeping tips uh, if you could share for us, Dr. B. Hello. There we go. And then uh, here we go. The disclosures, the fun stuff, right? The boring stuff before we get to the real fun stuff. Again, guys, I'm Dr. Barfield. I am a full-time employee of Overjet. Dr. Browder nor her family members uh, have any financial interest to disclose relating to the content of this particular presentation and commercial support for this CE program is provided by Overjet. The activity is being jointly provided with CE Zoom Partners LLC and members of CE Zoom Planning Committee have no relevant financial relevations to disclose. I also wanted to uh, tag on to what uh, Tori said at the beginning. We wanna take your questions and answers uh, at the end of the presentation. If you'll hold those and either put them in the chat or the Q&A function, that will be uh, helpful for us and we'll have time to address those at the end of the presentation. So thank you so much. So uh, without any further ado, Dr. Rebecca Browder. Dr. Browder, tell us about yourself. How did you get into dentistry? How did I get into dentistry? Um, so my journey into dentistry is a little um, bit of a circuitous route. I worked, I went to college as a chemistry major, decided I didn't want to be a chemist, wanted to go abroad. So I majored in French and Italian, graduated with a degree in two languages I actually don't speak and then worked uh, as a bartender in real estate and then onto marketing and advertising for about eight years before I had an appointment with a local dentist and I uh, had an epiphany. I was in the chair and I looked up and I thought I could do this uh, and everything just clicked. So I quit my job two months later. I was in post back and I never looked back. I, I love every second of it. So it took me a while to get here. Um, but since that moment, I, I have absolutely adored it. Now, now, I know you, but I didn't know a lot of that story. That's incredibly impactful and wonderful. Uh, I love the diversity in, the, in your story. Tell me about your practice. Um, what, what's happening up there in, in Westport as your family practice? Oh, so much. It's so cool over here in Westport. <laughs> um, so my practice is... Um, about 50 years old. I'm the fourth um, owner of it. And um, I took over just before COVID. And it was actually my first full-time job. I had been working part-time as I had a couple of children. Um, and then this was my first full-time job. And nine months into it, um, uh, my um, uh, boss that I was working for decided he was going to relocate to Texas. So he said, hey, I have an, a buyer for the practice, but would you like it? And so I said, you know what? Let's do it. Let's go ahead and do it. And so um, uh, I jumped on it. We signed the deal in February of 2020. And then March 2020, we closed the office <laughs> um, and we were shut down for about two months. But it gave me, I actually loved that time. It was so valuable for me because I didn't know what I was doing. And it gave me this block of time to go in with no patients and really focus on the practice. So the very first place that I started was IT. I don't know why I chose that, but that for me just sounded like I needed to get kind of all of that. I, I knew from the beginning that IT and computers and before AI was even a thing, I knew it was going to be a big part of my practice. So I started there and I started kind of getting my idea for what sort of x-rays I wanted. Did I want a CBCT? Did I want a scanner? And I started dipping my toes in the water. Um, and so that's kind of where the practice started. And then since that time, every little part of technology or um, AI or computer, whatever that I have put into the practice has 
only been advantageous for me and has only bettered the practice. And now I'm a straight up addict. Like I'm, I'm just a salesperson's dream. You know, they come to me and they're like, Hey, we've got a new thing. I'm like, great. I'll take two. Um, and I try all of these things, but they have just made the practice so much better. So I am a full-time, um, family practitioner. I see everybody and we do kind of a range of, um, comprehensive dentistry, um, and with kind of more of a focus on preventative dentistry, really getting there and identifying things early. Um, and then also a fun um, focus on cosmetics. Um, but again, all in a minimal, kind of minimally invasive way. So having all of this tech allows me to do that. I love that. And, and you and I have talked often about technology and dentistry and where we think all this is headed. And it really is um, something that is going to bring to our practices the ability to, to do better quality dental care for our patients. And at, at the end of the day, that sort of is the umbrella idea that we're talking about here, right? 100%. When I was getting, when I was going into dental school, I knew that within dentistry, I had two focuses that I loved. I loved um, public health and I loved cosmetic dentistry. And I was like, that's going to be a hard thing to marry. But I do feel like all of the um, the tech and AI and all of the um, it, all of the things that have been developed with our help with computers and digital dentistry are actually allowing us to get to a point where that's going to be a realization where we're going to be able to not only take care of our patients but also provide like beautiful artistic restorations that we love. So it's going to be great for them. It's going to be fulfilling for us. It's awesome. Sort of our nirvana, right? Exactly. Yeah. Happy campers. And as a, as a great segue, um, you know, into what technology is actually bringing to our practices and then ultimately to our patients, what's the starting point for that, right? Where, where do we start there? We don't just jump into, well, where here's our treatment plan and here's our treatment and out comes a beautiful aesthetic result. There's a starting point somewhere, right? There's always a starting point. Yeah. Um, and that I think is different depending on how you practice. Um, but I think the starting point for me is always diagnostics. Um, and that's kind of what this presentation is going to be about, um, getting all of that information together so that you can synthesize all of that information. You can develop an appropriate treatment plan, and then you can explain it to the patient. Because even if your treatment plan is improving home care, you have to be able to explain that to the patient, to educate them and allow them to become empowered so that they actually take action even if it's as simple as starting to floss more. Sure. sure. And, and how does, how does that, uh, that up leveling that we're talking about, right. For the, for that diagnosis and ultimately the plan sort of play out and where do we kind of start with that? And, and why okay. is that conference exam, comprehensive exam, so important to everything that we do? All right. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and launch into some of the slides here to um, answer that question, if that works. Um, so this first picture I took just as a joke, but um, uh, it kind of represents how I felt um, uh, my patient saw me originally. You know, I, I knew that I had studied for countless hours. I knew that I had gone to school, that I had gone to residency, that I had passed my boards. I knew that I was qualified to give them a treatment plan. And I just assumed that they saw all of that greatness in me too. So when I would go in and I would do my exams, I would not really focus on trying to educate them or trying to show that side of me. Instead, what I wanted to do is kind of focus on the patient and focus on my relationship with the patient. So I would, um, uh, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, so I would go in and I would have more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the patient where I would ask them tell me about yourself. How is little Timmy? How's the softball game going? How are the kids acclimating to their third you know, sibling or whatever it is? And so the patients and I are forming this really great bond. And I'm thinking, okay, this is wonderful. They're going to start to trust me. Um, and that was true to a certain degree. Um, but what they didn't know was that while I'm having this conversation with them, I'm also going through and doing all of the things that we do during our exam. So I'm examining their periodontal condition. I'm looking for signs of inflammation and calculus. I'm looking for, you know, signs of lichen planus. Do they have any sort of cancer that I can um, identify? I'm looking at their restorations. Are these in uh, good shape or do they need repair? Are they clenching? Are they grinding? Um, were these bonded properly? Do we have leakage? Um, all of those things. I'm looking at their function. So I'm looking to see, okay, do we have uh, fractions? Do they put too much pressure? Again, are they a bruxer? Do they have an airway issue? Um, are they brushing too hard? Whatever it might be. 
And of course, um, uh, not everybody, but um, most of us are also looking at the cosmetic aspect because if we can improve a smile aesthetically as well, that's the cherry on top. So I'm looking at their gingival architecture. I'm looking at their tooth size and shape. Do they need whitening? Um, all of those things. So as I'm talking to them and getting to know the patient and forming that personal bond, all of this information is being processed in my head because I'm so smart. I can multitask like that. And I'm coming up and kind of uh, creating their treatment plan. And so I'll say, okay, you know, it was a, a great, um, great visit today. Uh, this is what you're going to need. You need four quads of SRP. You're going to need fluoride varnish, you know, four times a year, six fillings, two onlays, one crown, and you're going to need some alignment. Um, the, Sam will take care of you at the front desk. So good to see you. I'll see you next time. Great. We love each other. And I leave the room. And so then I'll go over and I'll say, hey, um, when's Jamie's next appointment? And um, I was always shocked. I was like, what do you mean? They didn't schedule. What do you mean she didn't make another appointment? She's got so much going on. How did she, why does she not make another appointment? And what I realized was that I was forming a really good bond with them, but they weren't being educated or empowered to make that decision, to exercise their autonomy as a patient and to feel invested in their care. As far as they knew, nothing hurt. They didn't need any of this. And I remembered back to a um, dental visit that I had before I had decided to become a dentist. And it was at a chain dentist. Um, and the woman that was my dentist was probably recently out of school, but she was the first person to stand me up and have me look at my bite wings. And she talked me through it. And she might've been talking me through it because she was also you know, kind of piecing things together herself. But whatever it was, it was so impactful for me because I, oh, Oh, that's why I need a filling. Okay, great. Where do I sign? And so I had her in the back of my head and I said, all right, you know, like, what do we do? What can we do? How can we get um, our patients to that next step? And so that's when I started to bring in digital scanning and AI. The more I can um, teach the patient, the better. When I first started talking to patients, I would, you know, try to explain, hey, this is, um, you know, periodontal condition. This is the crown. This is the root. This is where your bone is. And if the bacteria gets down, the bone's going to go. And I'm pantomiming these things. And the patient's like, uh, okay, you know, and then I'm trying to draw it and I'm not drawing it well. And then I'm getting videos from, you know, Spear Club or, or something like that. But there's nothing that I found that's more impactful than being able to show the patient their own mouth. Doesn't matter if it's somebody else's mouth, they need to see their mouth. So in our office, um, we have a couple of different digital scanners that we use, um, but in our hygiene, we do wellness exams um, as well as our um, x-rays. We usually alternate the six month visit. So one's gonna be a wellness exam and one's gonna be our x-rays. Um, and so we'll use that and we combine that with our artificial intelligence. And this is how we've been rolling it out for about the past year. And it's just been awesome working with our patients. Um, and so what we'll do is my my hygiene, um, uh, it was difficult to get them on board because obviously you need buy-in from your team in order to roll these things out into your practice. And the last thing anybody wants to do is add more to their list of things to do within that hour appointment. But once I started showing the team and showing the patients the value that was there, the team was on board. They loved it because not only um, did it give patient value, but it also allowed them to become much more involved in treatment planning. Now with what they can see on the AI and with what they can see on our wellness scans, they're starting the treatment plan before I even get in there. They know what we're looking for. They're seeing, um, and it's standardized across all of my hygienists because here it is in different colors. They can see all of this in black and white or red and blue or yellow and green, whatever the color is. Um, they're able to see all of that. And so across all of my hygienists, they're starting to standardize these treatment plans. So I'm coming in and a lot of my work is done not only with having to come up with what the treatment plan is, but also they've started mentioning these things and starting showing these things to the patient already. So that when I come in, they know they need to have the x-rays up, 
they need to have over jet up and they need to have the most recent scan up. And that's going to be my way. I'm going to come in. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to get the information from them. I'm going to do my exam. And then I'm going to be able to tell the patient what I see. So the first thing um, that we always do, like I said, is we'll have Overjet up, um, we'll have our Itero scan up, and we'll take it from there. And usually when we have the Itero scan up, the first thing the patient always says is, are my teeth that yellow? Um, and I, you know, it's it's fun. It's an icebreaker. It's a nice way to make a joke and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, it just sells whitening for us. And no, 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 your teeth aren't that yellow. But I love that question because it's starting a conversation. They're asking, they're already discovering things about their teeth. So now we have this reflection up there for them on a big screen that they can zoom in, zoom out, spin around, and they're starting to become inquisitive. And so I say, okay, you know what? Your teeth aren't really that yellow, but let's take a look. And I'll bring up this screen and I'll start to look um, uh, at all of the areas of the tooth. And we'll go through all of those different areas that we that we were discussing before. We'll go through their periodontal condition, restorative, functional occlusion, and we'll show them what we see, what that means, and then what steps we can take to improve it. And then whether or not they do it is up to them. My job is not to make the decision that, oh, you know what? They're not going to do whitening. They're not going to do alignment. They're not going to do an omelet. They're not going to replace the fillings. That's not my job. My job is to say, hey, I'm educated in this. This is what I identify. This is the problems it can cause or is causing. And this is the treatment that we can offer you. From conservative to invasive, this is what we have. And now you're educated. You're empowered. You tell me, how do you want to handle your mouth? And so it's really been a wonderful conversation to the patient. I'm still getting to hear about Timmy's t-ball game and everything, but um, now we're getting to have a different layer of trust and a different layer of engagement from the patient that helps them become more empowered and more invested in their care. You mentioned that trust factor. That's a really important one for us, isn't it? Yeah, huge. Uh, I think that, um, you know, that's one of the real challenges we have in dentistry, right, uh, with low case acceptance rates, and we know what those are across the board, um, there's an opportunity for improvement there, right? If we can get to that trust factor, that third point of the trust triangle, we can have a, a, an impact there and make a difference. Yeah, 100%. And that has made a difference for me. Um, and I'll talk about this a little later, kind of um, uh, the changes that we saw since we started implementing this process um, in our treatment acceptance and the amount that we were able to produce. And I wasn't changing the way that I practiced so much. You know, I didn't become really invasive or aggressive. I didn't learn some new, I didn't start placing, you know, all on X's. I just started educating the patient for my bread and butter dentistry. Mm -hmm. And I was getting more accept acceptance and it ended up being better for the patient and better for our bottom line. So having that trust where they're just, you know, it's a very vulnerable position to be in to lay back and open up and just say, okay, you do what you have to do. You know, now they know the why and they trust you even more. It's a beautiful relationship builder. Um, so for us, when we, when I go in to see my patients, as I said, we'll have, um, our x-rays up, um, I'll look at our x-rays first. I always like to treat my AI and, um, my computers as adjuncts to me. They don't replace me. There are going to be things that I pick up from my clinical experience um, that uh, might not be picked up on some of these things. So I'm not off the hook entirely, um, but I'll go in, I'll familiarize myself, and then I'll bring up um, the different aspects either in Overjet or Itero. And so the first thing that we're looking at here is just a little screen grab. I think we have an updated one. Yeah, just a little screen grab from one of my patients. Um, and what we're seeing here, this is before there was a new rollout recently. What we're seeing here is on the top, you'll see the date of the perio chart. So it's pulling in the information, the clinical information from my um, hygienist who recently perio charted. And it's telling me, what teeth were identified as having um, probing greater than four millimeters. Um, and this is also then going in and they're looking at this patient and they're identifying areas like we have on this lower left-hand side here and identifying areas where there's little wisps of calculus. They're identifying areas where we have bone loss. The nice thing that has changed with a recent update, which I can show you on the next slide, 
is that um, uh, we now have an area, instead of just going from green to red, from one millimeter to three millimeters, we now have the two millimeters um, highlighted in yellow. This has been super helpful for us as well, especially with my hygienist, because it has been able to identify those people that are a little bit more at risk um, and a little bit more, we can be more proactive and preventative with them so that we're not waiting for this like egregious amount of bone loss before we realize, oh, you need SRP. You know, we're not waiting for them to get to a point where we now are, we're reacting um, retroactive or not retroactive, we're reacting to them as opposed to being proactive um, yeah. to the condition. So I'm really loving this. But so this is what I'll bring up first. I'll look at areas where um, the computer has measured from the um, cemento enamel junction down to the level of bone. And then I'll go in and I'll probe around and I'll see. Sometimes what we'll see is that the um, uh, the bone on the buckle is higher, but we may have a bone drop on the lingual. So we still have to go around and we still have to probe. But this is a really great thing because it's so easy for me to visualize. I have it up in the screen and I know, okay, I'm looking over and the greens, I'll, I'll go around, but maybe I won't spend as much time there. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna confirm the findings that I see on here. So I'm gonna confirm, do we have gingival inflammation or bone loss in the areas of 18, 19? What do we have to do there? Do we have to do a local SRP? Are we doing a gingivitis? Are we improving um, home care? And we're gonna see them again in three months. What sort of proactive step are we taking? Because clearly something's going on in their hygiene. And additionally, I love this because now that we're getting into, we're gonna be coming up on a year pretty soon, we're gonna be able to see this year over year. So instead of being like, I don't know, I think you were three millimeters last year, we're gonna be able to see tenths of a millimeter changes. And we're gonna be able to, again, intervene before things have gotten worse, before things have gotten terrible. Um, and hopefully that's just as simple as um, improving the home care and calling it a day. But if we need to do more hygiene or periodontal therapy there, awesome, all the better. We're getting the patient what they need. And showing the patient this, awesome. So great because then they get it. They know it's not me. They know it's not my hygienist who's like, well, you know, I've never had a problem before. You may never have had a problem before, but you probably also didn't have this. You didn't have this that was helping to identify issues and helping to um, treat them. So we'll look at the periodontal condition um, on the x-rays. I'll look intraorally and then I'll bring up the scan again for them. And I'll show them, you know, so commonly we have this um, built up on our um, lower anteriors. And I love this particular patient because she walked in <clears throat> to my office and she has such a myriad of different conditions going on. She needed an omelet, she needed some filling, she needed a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So it's really, um, she had all of this plaque built up and tartar around these lower anteriors. And to show them this picture, oh my God, worth a thousand words right? You know, like who's going to look at this and be like, oh, I'm good. I'll keep my tartar. Thanks. I'll see you never. You know, you just look at it and you're like, you'll get it out, get it out now. I don't care what it is. Just get it out now. Um, and so that's been super helpful, right? You've seen patients like this, like all the yeah. time. Yeah. All the time. Um, so this has been really effective for helping patients um, uh, buy into our periodontal treatment. And also, like I said, just becoming more involved and invested at home. They're, you know, picking up the floss a lot more. They're getting a water pick and they're using it. It's not like, oh yeah, I bought it, but I don't use it. They see it, they get the need for it now and they're getting involved and they're using it. And it's been huge for them. I heard um, the someone said uh, they don't really need to even know what bone loss is. They can understand what color change is. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And that's why I really love this new yellow too, because it's like I said, we're saying, Hey, you're, you may not need a deep cleaning now, but we're starting to see some changes and we're starting to see that this is getting to a point where we don't want it to be. We don't want it to progress. So we're going to become a little bit more proactive and we're going to start with you. Um, and so, yeah, they don't, they don't necessarily need to know the biologic factors that are leading into it. All they see is that color. Or all they see is that picture. And it's, it's super impactful for them. Love that. Um, sorry. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll go into restorative after that. Um, you know, the gums are our foundation. So we always start there and then looking at the teeth. Um, uh, 
with this patient in particular, uh, on her right side, we saw two areas um, uh, that were highlighted, one for incipient caries and one for caries that were through the, um, uh, the CEJ. So we were going to go ahead and treat that. Now with our incipient caries, we have a couple of different ways we would treat that. It could be as simple as a fluoride varnish. It could be something like Curadont um, or a resin infiltration anything like that. So we start to look at this. And then I love because our x-rays show us interproximal caries so well. Um, uh, I love um, going and then comparing it with our iTero and using our near infrared imaging um, and just seeing kind of how those two come together, seeing it from a different angle and examining the patient and putting that all together because this incipient, I actually ended up going in and treating. Um, and it was with the help of our, our iTero, but, um, uh, you know, I might've missed it being an incipient on this x-ray and maybe wouldn't have looked so closely at it on my iTero if I hadn't caught it here. Um, so and the other thing, sorry, some of those are hard to see. Some of those are super hard to see. And the same goes for occlusals. You know, these bite wing x-rays aren't meant to diagnose occlusals. Um, and so sometimes I don't catch it. Sometimes I'm not even looking for an occlusal. The first week that I had AI in my practice, um, I think one of the first patients that I saw it on was a teenager or 20 something, not a filling in his mouth, beautiful teeth. And, um, overjet picked up carries on number 30. And I was like, okay, you know, I highly doubt it. And I looked at the tooth and I was like, the enamel looks intact. Maybe there's a little bit of shadowing under the enamel, but like, I'm not seeing anything bombed out, but I decided to roll the dice and trust the AI. And I gave the patient a heads up. I said, Hey, this is not something that we typically um, see on x-rays. And this is a new program that I'm working with, but I think that it's worth a look. Let me go in, let me get you numb. I'll start to go in. And if I don't find anything, I'll keep it really superficial. And you know, I said, I, I think I said, I won't even charge you for it. And the patient was on board and I opened it and boom, dropped right into it. And that, that was it for me. I was like sold. I just paid for my, you know, I just paid for my membership off of the one filling and I never would have seen it before. And practicing as a solo practitioner, that's huge. That's huge to have something that's going to be that second pair of eyes. Um, so I um, see these, I go and I compare it to what we have on our um Itero, we use that near infrared imaging. So on the upper right here, you can see um, areas of decay. Um, uh, we opened, see it a little bit closer, opened that up, saw the decay um, and treated it. And we were happy with that. Scroll over and on the uh, upper left-hand side for the patient, number 15, it's got that huge amalgam. And this is a wonderful case where the patient says, I don't feel anything. It's fine. It's been there, it's been there for 30 years. We're good. And this is where I'll take my, um, uh, my tech and I'll say, you know what? It's not good. It's not great. This is going to be a problem for you. I've seen it. I know it's going to happen. The literature supports it. Let's look at it together. So I'll see this big silver um, uh, amalgam. I'll see some of the demineralization areas, some of the fracture areas. I'll go back. I compare it with the x-ray. I see the areas of decay on the mesial and on the lingual. I'm sorry, on the mesial and on the ding distal. Um, and then we'll also start to see this is this particular um, tooth, but we're also able to see now in some of our x-rays with the new rollout, other areas like is there a periapical radiolucency? Is there endo needed on this? Um, how close is the proximity to the nerve? Are we concerned about that happening? You can see the enamel and the um, caries there. Um, uh, and then we'll go back and I'll say, hey, so this is what we have. We have a tooth that right now is asymptomatic. I see that there's some leaching going on. I see that there are some fracture lines. There's some demineralization. And I know from the literature that cusps less than X number of millimeters, two to three millimeters are more prone to fracture. So that's what I'm concerned about. Let's go and see the pressure you're putting on this tooth. Okay, patient, here's the pressure. And so we see you're putting a lot of pressure here and a lot of pressure here in those remaining areas of enamel. Let's go back to the tooth. You see how 
Now, do you see what I'm saying? This tooth doesn't need a filling. This tooth needs an online. So now we have been proactive about treating the patient and we've done it in the right way. And we've done it in a way that they have buy-in. You know, it's not like, why did I get upsold from having a fine silver filling to having an onlay, you know? And it's not overly aggressive because I don't have to do a full crown once the tooth breaks. I'm being conservative here. I'm being proactive and I'm being conservative at the same time, um, which I think is, is super important to the way that I practice. Um, so after we look at our uh, periodontal and our, our restorative concerns, then I'm going a little bit more and I'm saying, okay, let's round this picture out now. What other functional issues are we having? So we bring up her screen again and I say, okay, you know, I see here that you have, um, uh, you've had ortho before, you have a um, broken lingual wire. We'll start looking at whether or not there's relapse. I'll say, okay, I see over here, you have something called abfractions. We'll talk about how um, lingual inclination can worsen those abfractions and how um, alignment comes into play with that. Um, we'll go down and we'll toggle to her screen and go to um, our stone image and we'll look at our wear that we're having because this tooth is a little bit more facial and it's starting to get more wear because it's coming in contact with your um, opposing teeth here and the, the value of having teeth get into alignment. So it's not having straight functional teeth because they're pretty. Um, or not doing Invisalign or clear aligners or traditional orthodontics because it's pretty, but it's actually for a reason. Straight teeth are healthy teeth for a reason because you're not going to have that extra wear. You're not going to have that abfraction. You're not going to have forces being put on a tooth that's detrimental to the tooth. You're going to have everything where it should be, forces dispersed as it should be, and that's going to have the teeth last for a longer period of time. And that's kind of how we explain it to our patients and being able to show this is really beneficial. Um, and then last kind of my most Favorite thing, um, uh, we drift a little bit away from our AI um, with this, but it's also um, really great in having these instruments and this um, information, these diagnostics cohesively because we can figure out what's the best way to go about it from a cosmetic standpoint too. Um, so lots of times when we'll have our iTero up, um, I'll be able to see the patient and I'm saying, oh, you've got beautiful teeth. You've got beautiful, um, healthy teeth. But um, I noticed that they're a little bit, it almost looks like you're hiding a little bit of your teeth. And the patient will say, yeah, you know, I just don't like it. And so we could hypothetically say, you know what, we're going to do 10 veneers up here. But for this patient, I said, I think what you need is I think you just have a little bit of passive eruption. What if we just do a quick gingivectomy and open that up a little bit? Um, super non-invasive, super easy. And she was sold right there. And this took 15 minutes. And she's a patient for life. Like she was so pumped about it. She sends us before and after pictures and she's like, I love my new smile. Um, so it allows us to communicate with a patient and give them these little things where it doesn't have to be a huge cosmetic overhaul, but patients benefit from this. You know, not only is it going to remove some of that excess um, uh, some of that excess gingiva that may be causing a little bit of a plaque trap, um, but it's giving her a smile that's a little bit more her. So love that. Um, this was a patient that came in. She had some concerns about uh, tooth four and two, three and four, those crowns. She didn't really like the color of the crowns. And as we got into it, I was like, oh, this is something where I think you could actually be really happy for who she is as a patient from changing her alignment was pretty good, but we needed to change the shape of some of these teeth. So we started to go through and I did a quick mock-up and I said, you know, I think if we raise this, we change the shape, we make them a little bit bigger here, we bring them out a little bit, you're gonna be a bit happier. And she was sold too. So we did end up doing um, veneers on her, mostly additive, which was also awesome as well. Um, and she was just super pumped about it. And so having these things, having Overjet, having, um, my iTero or, you know, I, like I said, I use a couple of different um, scanners. Um, having my CBCT is another one. Having these things and being able to integrate them all together removes all of my guessing. It removes my like second guessing. And I don't know, I think I'm just going to wait and watch because I don't know how this is going to plan out. Um, uh, it gets rid of all of that. And it makes my treatment planning so much more clear cut. So, you know, it's standardizing everything. Now there's not one patient that gets 
this and somebody else that gets this. My hygiene is all seeing the same thing. Like the comment before, things are color coded. You know, it makes it pretty idiot proof um, for those of us in the dental field and our patients. So everybody's getting the same. The, the the hygienists know this is going to yield X treatment because this is what we're seeing. Um, it's great with our um, insurance approvals because I love it. I love it now. I I wait for patients to receive a denial, and I just I can't wait to write that narrative and put in like here's my x-rays, here's my stuff from Overjet that has everything illustrated, here's my intraoral photo detailing everything, and it gets approved, and it's kind of a hassle that we have to do that, but the great thing about Overjet, and one of the things that initially sold me um, when I was considering um, bringing on AI was the relationship that they have with the with the insurance companies and how, um, and I guess you can speak more to this, um, Dr. B, about how it works with insurance, but we just don't we don't have an issue with it anymore well i think what's what's happening there really the power is in trying to measure with the same ruler that the insurers are, are measuring with right so they're utilizing ai uh, most of the big ones are and um we, we may as well get on the same page and use the same rulers right it's objective yeah. information it, that we're taking out the sub, yeah. some of the subjectivity in dentistry which is one of our big big challenges uh, and so I, I think that ultimately it's good for patients. It's good for payers overall. They see some cost savings in it that that way. So, and you know, bringing us to center, bringing us closer to a a centered truth, if you will. And I think that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Let me ask you something, Doctor B. If you had to, if you had to put a summary statement on the power of digital technology and tools, as, as well as AI, and what it is bringing to the overall exam and diagnosis process, what would you say to that? What, what's the power in it for you? Um, so one, I think it's an inevitability as we were talking about before. There's no escaping it. It's only just going to keep coming. Um, and embracing that for me, giving me this information has allowed me to move forward with such confidence um, uh, and as a single practitioner, that's huge because I don't have somebody I can go to and be like, hey, psst, what do you think about this? What would you do in this scenario? Mm -hmm. um, and so having all of this information has taken the guesswork out of dentistry. You know, we always say it's the practice of dentistry. This lessens that a little bit more. It takes away um, uh, some of the subjectivity. It takes away some of the um, questions about how something is going to proceed. I have data now. And with data, I can make decisions. Um, it's no longer my opinion. You know, it's no longer um, uh, what I want to do. This is what's recommended. This is the condition that you have. This is what's recommended. Um, and that's super empowering. I think not only from a uh, the standpoint of the entire team, because all of my team is on board with this. All of my team is understanding how it plays in, um, but also with the patient. And it's to your point, it's getting to the right place we want to be in dentistry. Nobody, you know, the vast majority of us want to practice ethically. We want to go home and not be nervous about, did we do something that we shouldn't have done? Or did we not treat something we should have treated? And this gives me that peace of mind. I'm able to go in and I'm able to know with a lot more certainty than I had previously, what the conditions are, what needs to be treated, when, why, and how. And now the patient knows it too, and it's shared responsibility. And so I could never, and I emphasize never, go back. This is as vital to me as practicing with loops. Like I could never practice without this. Um, and I don't. And if you look at my stats, probably if you were to pull up my account, I bet you we look at this with every single, not only do I look at it um, when patients are in for hygiene, when I'm treatment planning, but when I have a patient come in for restorative, I pull it up automatically again, because I want to see exactly where I'm drilling. Where do I have to be? How deep do I have to be? What do I have to watch out for? Um, it's just... It's invaluable information. Amazing, amazing. That this has been fantastic for me. I've, I've enjoyed listening to you. This is, and I haven't, 
had an opportunity to spend quite this much time with you before, and I love it. It's uh, it's very empowering, actually. And we're we're getting in a ton of really really good questions. You're going to love some of these. Um, so let's tell people how to first and foremost how to get their CE credit. I think that's going to be an important one before we jump into the Q and A here this evening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What you guys are going to want to do there is log into CE Zoom and then scroll down until you see the green verify button that uh, cor corresponds to this particular course, and then enter the word smile, and you take a short three-question evaluation that we've got prepared for you, and you'll, you'll get your credit in, in that fashion. You could also um, scan the QR code here. So we'll leave that up for a moment as we begin to uh, field some of these questions. The first one, Dr. B, that comes in, um, what do you do when patients want to take pictures of the scans as well as the x-rays to possibly shop around? Let them. Let them. Let them shop around. Yeah. Let them. Let them shop around. If they're going to shop. So for me, I love when people go to get second opinions because chances are they're probably going to, the vast majority of times, those people, whoever they went to, they come back. They come back. And if it's only, if they're only in it for the money, then um. I, I haven't done my job as a practitioner. I think maybe I haven't educated them enough. Maybe I haven't made them find the value or conversely, do I have to look at my financing options? You know, am I, am I dropping the ball in that respect? Um, but for me, the more information, the better, the more empowered the patient, the more educated the patient, the better. So give them the information, let them take the pictures, let them shop it around. What's the worst that could happen? You know, they come back and they're like, oh yeah, it turns out you were right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I also want to mention that um, because it is gift giving season, um, this is important that uh, with this QR code tonight, anybody that uses this QR code and then uh, gets a demo off of this QR code, you're going to get a $50 gift card to Amazon, which is going to be really beneficial because it's gift giving season. And that's my gift to you guys. Just kidding. It's not from me, but um, I do it. It's valuable. And just for a little clarity on that one, we want to advance that slide one because this particular QR code is going to CE Zoom. And I think, there you go, Dr. B, that QR code is the one that um, has to do with the Amazon. Okay, um, second question, what does the color red or yellow mean? One is decay, but what is the other? And I think that the question is getting at what is the yellow color uh, sure. in, in the carries finding? Yeah, that's just incipient caries. So that means that the decay is visible in the enamel, has not crossed over to the um, cementum yet. And so for that, we tend to be a little bit more preventative in our treatment. Um, uh, sometimes um, uh, it's it can depend on the angulation of the film itself, like in this particular case that I showed where I saw incipient caries. Um, but then when I looked on, um, when I happened to look over at my um, digital scan, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. Um, and so the caries ended up, it did reach through the CEJ. But so yellow is for incipient caries, red is for something that goes through the CEJ. So that can be a nice delineation for you when you're coming up with your treatment plan. Are you gonna be more conservative and treat with fluoride varnish every three or six months? Are you gonna do a resin infiltration or are you gonna go in and actually break tooth structure and go in and do a, a filling there? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's spot on. I love this next question. I think this is a really crucial one for us uh, as, as community leaders. Does it seem that all these improvements with AI make less of a need for a dentist in every dental office? It may seem that way, but no. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I think we are one of the few, maybe not the few, but you know, everybody's getting that question now. All of the artists and writers and um, people are are stressed because their jobs are being taken over by Chat GPT or something like that. This cannot replace us at this moment in time. I don't know what the future holds, but at this moment in time, this is an adjunct to the way that I practice. This is additional information for me as much as x-rays were. Um, so this is all clinical information. This is all data that I am then taking. I am synthesizing. I am figuring out what is the correct treatment option for the patient here. So maybe at some point, we're gonna have a bunch of robots that can synthesize this for us and then do the restoration for us, but I don't think it's coming anytime soon. Um, and then I also think that going back to our conversation before with trust, 
this builds trust. This um, a patient is going to be much less likely to move forward with treatment if they don't know why or to move forward they're not even going to floss if they don't know why you know nobody does that stuff unless it's, there's something in it for them um so i think this ai is definitely not in a position to do anything but be additive to our ability as clinicians to be the best clinicians we can be and to be to be even better than ai alone yeah i totally agree with that and i think one of the important concepts sort of to bring out in in this discussion is that um, this AI is not a diagnosis making machine. A diagnosis can only be made by a dentist uh, and it can't make a treatment plan for you. It can't do the dental exams. This is another set of eyes. It's no different in my view than things like loops. You mentioned loops and explore your tactile sense in your hands an air water syringe and x-ray itself. This is just another tool for helping you in making that accurate assessment for the patient, and then ultimately your diagnosis that you are responsible for making. So yeah. I think it's important to know. Um, a couple that are linked here, how good is the AI at recognizing recurrent caries around a restoration? And the second question that links to that is, can this detect cavities underneath restorations? Yes. I uh, am. Um, so yes, it can detect cavities under restorations. Yes, it can detect recurrent decay. Um, and this is where, to your point before, where this is a diagnostic tool. Um, this is not um, identifying caries. What it's identifying is a change in the density of the tooth. It is then my job as a clinician to go in and say, okay, is that a liner under that filling? Is that why there's a, a radiolucency there? Is there, um, is there, you know, a layer of bond there? Is that what that radiolucency is? Is it just the anatomy of the tooth? Is there a mesial concavity there? Is there cervical burnout? Um, so yes, it is great at detecting. I can't remember from back when I um, signed up, but there's some some statistic about the shades of gray that the AI can see that we can't see necessarily on our monitors where it's picking up that variation in stays of gray and picking up the discrepancies between it. And that's what it's identifying. So it's not telling you, you have active decay. It's telling you, look over here. There's an area here that is less dense than we think it should be. And then you go in and you decide what you wanna do with it. But it's great at picking up those areas. Next question um, comes in. Any instances where AI detected something, but it actually wasn't there? In other words, there was a, an artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence detection on an x-ray or a finding on an x-ray. And when you looked at it clinically, it just wasn't there. You examined the tooth, you used all the other tools that we know to use in examining a tooth and the finding just wasn't there. Does that happen? All the time. And here's what I mean by it. Um, so the interproximal uh, lesions, very rarely does it happen there. But where it does happen, where I do find it is, let's say there's been um, some uh, incisal wear on a canine. The AI will pick up there. You'll get a big red spot right at the tip of the canine. And after going through a while, I know these certain areas where it's just going to be areas of wear or it's going to be um, a change in the anatomy of the tooth. Um, uh, so there, there are times when you're going to disregard some of the information that's presented for you. But again, this goes back to being a diagnostic tool. This is showing you areas to watch out for, areas to look for. It's your job as the clinician to then go and make that change. So it's bringing up this area on this canine. So it may not be decay, but it's my job to look and go see that canine and realize that this patient either has an airway issue or a bruxing issue and needs a night guard or a sleep appliance or something like that. So it's useful in diagnosing not just caries, it's useful in diagnosing diagnosing all, you know, the tooth structure should be there. It knows what tooth structure should be there. So why isn't it there? And let's figure out that. The only other area I see sometimes is like cervical burnout, usually on the distals of the upper first molars. But again, that's a pretty isolated case where I've just been able to see that. And usually I'll see it on one film and not on the other. Um, but overall for the interproximal lesions that we're looking at for our bread and butter dentistry, what we're thinking this would be most useful for, it's pretty spot on for me. 100%. Um, how much extra time did it take to implement this AI during hygiene appointments? 
wondering how to implement smoothly without overwhelming the patient with too much information without having ample time to explain it? That's a great question, isn't it? That is a great question. Really and awesome. that is a, that's more of a question about how you want to practice. Um, so the, what I mean by that is as far as implementing overjet, super simple. So you take your x-ray and then within like 90 seconds or something like that, it's up on your portal on overjet. So as long as you have that ability to look at the internet in your op uh, with the patient or, um, you know, if there's a computer or the internet in the op, it's as simple as the looking at the x-rays the way you normally would, but now they are, um, now they're annotated for you. Um, so it has actually cut down my time where I have to go in and diagnose because I don't have to go in and look at my x-rays and play with the grayscale and bring out my magnifying glass. I do a quick scan of my x-rays and I bring up and I look at Overjet and I see if there was anything that I missed. And then from there, depending on how much I need to explain to the patient, I can, I can spend more time. I tend to spend more time with my patients. That's the way my practice is. But on days where we have three hygiene there and we're kind of going, 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 um, we may just take a, take a snapshot with our um, patient software and text it over to them. Um, but usually we just show the patient, we'll say, hey, you want to see it? Here it is. Simple. Simple. So I think that this actually takes away a lot of the time of needing to explain. For me, cut down. Uh, Dawn says, is a cone beam in the office necessary for the AI to work? Do we need to have a 3D on his? No, not for me. Um, uh, I, you can um, mention anything different. I don't use the cone beam um, with Overjet. Um, I use my cone beam for more aesthetic cases, larger cases when I'm marrying it with a with an iTero scan, um, uh, but for not for Overjet for me. Right. Current practice, uh, we're not reading 3D data yet. You guys can imagine that that will come with time, but we are still living largely in a 2D dental world. Uh, so so uh, 2D at the, at the moment, but 3D is being worked on. And in the future, that certainly will be a part of what uh, we're doing. It'll be a part of dentistry, more, more and more in dentistry as we go along. How much does Overjet cost? Is it a monthly subscription? The, the cost depends upon a number of factors, depending upon the size of your, your practice, your organization, features that you get. Um, so if you want to know that specifically, I think the best thing to do is to reach out maybe uh, with a demo with one of the account executives. They can give you the specific details on that, but there are tiers for it. And yes, it's typically a monthly subscription. And worth every penny, might I add. Make sure that we got all of these questions here. These are great questions, guys. We really appreciate these. And we also appreciate everyone for being here this evening. Uh, make sure that you get a screen clip on the QR code, scan the QR code there. And if you do sign up for a demo, we're sending out a $50 Amazon gift card for you. Okay, good, good. I think we've got them here. Any other questions? We'd love to take those as we have just a few more minutes this evening. I hope this has been beneficial for you all. I know it's been fun for me uh, getting to hear about Dr. Browder and her, her amazingly diverse entry into dentistry and as well as how she practices is uh, something I would never tire of. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true, but thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I am a bit of a fangirl for um, Overjet. I'm, I love tech in general, but um, I'm a bit of a fangirl for Overjet. So it's a real pleasure. For sure, for sure. Let's see, maybe one more. Thank you, Lauren. She's a great webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it to all of you guys. I know you're spending time here after probably a long day at work. And I remember during my practicing days, one of the last things that I wanted to do was to take my dinner time out and watch a CE webinar to get my credits at the end of the year. But it is necessary. And uh, thank you guys for being here. We had a really good group tonight. It was a, a, a pretty large group. Uh, Heidi says, this presumes 
that we have digital scanning and digital x-rays, question mark. So for me, um, um, I used, the, the two are kind of separate. Um, I do have digital x-rays and I assume that you would need that um, for, for Overjet to work. The digital scanning, you don't need, you don't need to have it. Um, it's really beneficial, <laughs> but you don't need to, to work together with the two. I do, but they don't need to work together. That's right. And Heidi, the, uh, the Overjet platform uh, needs digital radiography, right? Uh, it's as simple as you take your x-rays in your normal workflow and in nearly real time, and Dr. B, you can comment on this, uh, the x-rays show up within the Overjet platform with the artificial um, intelligence overlays on them. It happens very quickly on, in an automated fashion in the background while you're working. Yeah, super seamless. Whenever we've gone in, um, as usually as soon as they take the x-rays and come get me, I think it's within 90 seconds or something like that. We've never tested it, um, but there's never really been an issue where I went on and I was like, come on, it's still loading. They're there. Oh, do, I, do we have one more minute? I forgot to talk about my other favorite thing um, about Overjet is that when we first, when I first brought it on, um, it goes back through all of your x-rays for the last 18 months and it starts to identify everything. So there's a patient dashboard for everyone you're seeing that day. Um, and, and so it will say like, hey, you saw this patient 10 months ago or something and you missed something. You missed SRP or they need second stage SRP or you missed a perio exam, you coded as a regular exam or you miscoded this or you should have done, you know, um, you, you missed you know, recurrent decay here, all of these things. So for me, that's awesome because we use that in our morning huddles where we go in and we're not saying like, well, we've got to squeeze out an extra $2,000 today. We're looking at, hey, where did we miss something clinically? What does the patient actually need? And that's how we're generating our production. And just by doing this within, I think, I can't remember if it was the last year or um, when we started doing the iTero and the um, uh, Overjet, our production without changing really anything else increased by 200,000. So like we, it's just so seamless to get this information and use it to drive your practice without feeling salesy, without feeling like you're pressuring people, you're diagnosing, you're giving information and they're taking it. And it's just, it's been a really seamless kind of natural organic way for us to increase um, our, increase our production, which has been a huge, awesome benefit, obviously. And that, that's a very powerful statement because really what we're, we're after is we're after the opportunities that we have missed. And we know that we all miss these things and we miss them regularly. That's the truth of clinical dentistry, right? It is, we are going to miss things. We're busy. We're challenged. We have lots of things going on in the office. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm shocked at the things that I have missed in a 33 year clinical career. The, the number is immense. And this is about making sure that we capture those opportunities in the best way that we can do that, not necessarily about the production values that may happen to come along with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for the time this evening. We really do appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Browder, for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, I know you had a full clinical day and uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. So appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you all. 